Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I've been given the uh, privilege over the last several years of more or less coming to this conference and editorializing on my viewpoint of the state of rheumatology as an industry. And um, although there'll be a couple of clinical lectures today, um, most of this, as Mike mentioned, are things that you won't necessarily get introduced to in your fellowship training. So today's agenda is for you. Um, let me just ask, uh, who are the first year fellows? Okay. And the second year fellows? Good. Just, just uh, a reference. How many are planning to go into academics? Good. I see one shy hand over there. <laughs> Two? Okay. And uh, private sector? Good. Are there any international medical graduates here that will leave the country before starting practice? No. Okay. Well, I think there's something in this for everyone. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask you to just sit back and relax and don't worry about taking notes. Um, you'll feel like this is drinking from the fire hose a little bit. But um, in, in my experience in our group, um, it really takes new graduates and even experienced physicians three or four years to sort of uh, internalize all that they have to learn about just the world of practice beyond the, the science. So um, hopefully today, through these series of lectures, we'll help you create a framework to hang more information on. Okay. So I'm going to cover three broad areas, not necessarily in a rigid order, but hopefully try to integrate these concepts. I'll be giving you some history and perspectives of rheumatology as an industry. We'll be talking about some durable concepts of service of working in service businesses, which is what rheumatology is, and uh, give you a little bit of idea of you know, what a market failure looks like and where we're going and how we can address our uh, issues. So if I were a, an industry analyst and I was analyzing an industry for investment purposes, there are certain things I'd want to know before making a buy or sell recommendation. And among those would be, what's the maturity of the... Um, industry. And that's often reflected by its guildsmanship, you know, what kind of organizations have the participants put together to help each other as well as to help the consumer. What's the uh, state of the scientific and technological advances? Is the industry dying? Is it withering? Or is it uh, still have a cutting edge of uh, evolutionary technology? Obviously, I want to know what the market is like. Is it expanding, contracting? Is it being broken up by other uh, industries? And lastly, who are the players? I mean, the industry rivals. How do they compete? How do they interact? And what does that mean? So in rheumatology, we've got some great organizations. We've got the ACR and the ULR. We've got advocacy organizations like CSRO and the Arthritis Foundation and NORM, which you'll hear about today. Um, we've got great scientific and technological advances. Many of us in this room have had two careers, as I refer to, the pre-technology career up until the late 90s, and then the post-technology career where we have not only the biologics and all these new things for osteoporosis, uh, almost every area of our practice has been advanced in the last uh, 17, 18 years, and it's really been uh, rewarding. Our market is large and expanding. When I started practice, um, U.S. population was about 2. Uh, 245 million. Now we're up to about 325 million. So we've seen this large expansion, not just because of the baby boom, but because of um, immigration and so many other factors. And what that means is a growing and accumulating burden of disease that we need to address. So we've got a great market. But when the analyst looks at the players, he sees that this is a very small industry. There's only four to 5,000 full-time participants, and they're kind of fragmented. There's no big industry leaders like a Coke or a Pepsi or something like that. And traditionally, we haven't really interacted very strongly um, to influence what happens. And he sees that there's a relatively decreasing number of rheumatologists relative to that market that's expanding. So why is it decreasing? So a quick history lesson. Back in the 
late 80s, early 90s, we had this shift in healthcare delivery towards a thing called managed care. You guys know what that is, but it dawned on me last evening uh, during a conversation that many of you may not know what came before that. There was this thing called indemnity insurance where my dad's employer gave him a, bought him a policy and he could go to see any doctor and that policy would pretty much pay all the costs. I mean, he had to shop a little bit because there were some limitations, but things worked well. And in that circumstance, money was not usually in the room during discussions about uh, a patient's care. But then we saw this shift towards managed care, which meant that the insurance companies, instead of providing indemnity insurance, would go to several employers and insure all of their people, and then they'd set these fee schedules. And if you were a physician trying to access that big bucket of patients, you had to agree to a set fee schedule to do that. So it looked like Medicare for all, except most of it was in the private sector. There's been another shift recently, and it has to do with shifting more out-of-pocket costs to the consumer, and that has another dynamic that we'll touch on in just a little bit. So in the late 2000s, in terms of our training programs, we saw that in the late 90s, about two-thirds of fellows were international medical graduates, and that's important because many of them have to leave the country. We saw that turn around again in the other 2000s, um, to where it's about 60, 40 domestic to international medical graduates. Then in 2014, we've drifted back to, again, about half being international medical graduates. In the meantime, we had another, we had a large workforce study uh, commissioned by the ACR that was published in 2006 that projected that between 2005 and 2025, the number of rheumatologists would increase by only about 1.2%, while the demand for our services would increase by about 46%. So, um, the analyst wants to know what's, what's going on here, and the, the participants, why are they there? Why did they choose rheumatology, and what are the upsides and downsides? Well, you've all seen surveys, and you know this. We like rheumatology because of the intellectual stimulation. We're considered intellectual and we have respect from our colleagues. We have a pretty good lifestyle. We don't have many emergencies. We get to have long-term relationships with patients that many of us value. And we've got all these exciting new therapies. But when the analyst looks at income, uh, therein lies the rub. And it it's, starts out being an obvious question of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is if, you know, if a company uh, has the opportunity to do one project, or another and has limited capital and has to choose, the income that you lose by choosing one over the other is opportunity cost. And it's really obvious, regardless of what survey you look at in, in physician salaries, that rheumatology tends to fall uh, in the bottom half. And for the extra years of fellowship that you um, spend, there's not a, a great return on that additional investment over internal medicine. So um, we've been following this for years, and Medscape has probably the largest database of respondents to look at who's up and who's down over time. In 2015, you can't see this, but rheumatology was down at the bottom of the stack. Uh, we were down 4% in incomes, and then the next year, we're at the top of the stack. We're up 12% in income. So it's, it's hard to understand what looks like a roller coaster ride. You know, in terms of practice satisfaction, 2012, we were the happiest. There were people saying that, well, rheumatology attracts happy people, right? And so in 2017, just recently, we're down at the bottom of the heap as being the most unhappy. So go figure. I think this is more personal and we're not going to learn a lot. But in general, uh, Medscape Lifestyle Survey in 2015 suggested that more than half of rheumatologists were satisfied with their practice situation, they were unsatisfied with their income. If they had it to do over again, they'd go into medicine, but they wouldn't go into rheumatology. So the latest workforce study published in 2015 is uh, telling us a story that uh, our workforce numbers are going down. Even when we put in increasing projections for help from nurse practitioners and PAs, the number of, of 
um, fellowship trained rheumatologists is decreasing uh, by quite a bit. We're going from about uh, 4,900 to 3,400 uh, through 2030. And there's lots of forces working against this workforce, not just the opportunity cost, but um, there's been this bubble. I mean, my generation, I'm the baby boom. We all trained in the 80s, okay? And now we're all going away. So there's about 50% retirement over the next 15 years from the baby boomers. Entering fellows were down for a number of years, and they're up through 14. There are a lot of programs that were not filling. Uh, we've gotten back in 2016 to where 60% of fellows are international medical graduates, and it's estimated that a third or more will need to leave. Um, women have been increasing in the workforce. Right now, we're about 60, 40 male, female, but in the fellowships, that's the opposite. And by 2030, it's going to be a 60, 40 uh, female world. And why is that important? It's because women have better things to do with their lives than just do all rheumatology. They raise families, they organize, uh, they keep us going. So what that means is that women tend to work fewer hours per week on average and fewer years uh, in a career. And then there's this millennial ascendancy. I love the way that sounds. That's the uh, generation that's coming up and they want more work-life balance. They don't want to work as hard as the old guys did. Um, and some of them will work part-time. So overall, the workforce study suggests that now, between now and 2030, we're going to see about a 31% decrease in rheumatology manpower, while our demand is going to go up by 138%. So that's how things look. So we know what the academic rheumatologists do for us. They train you. They're training you now. They're trying to prepare you to see patients and make decisions on a scientific basis and do well by your patients. In private practice, in the last 15 years, those of us who have been talking about this understand that there are really a couple of guiding principles for what private practice can do to foster the health of our industry. And these guiding principles begin with this first, that the ACR is endorsed over and over in position statements, and that's that the greatest risk to the quality of care of a patient with rheumatic disease is the unavailability of a rheumatologist. And that follows that private practice rheumatologists must optimize their business practices to optimize their profitability so we can compete for new blood if we're ever going to meet the demand. So simple paradigm, but how do we get there? I mean, first we have to look at what our challenges are and then think about the ways to address them. This um, paradigm is, is from a book called Competitive Strategy written in 1982 by a guy named Michael Porter at the Harvard Biz Business School. Um, he's actually still there. He was an advisor to the Obama administration, not only on healthcare policy, but on uh, a lot of other areas of industry. And the model works like this. These five forces, you have in the center uh, the industry rivals, the competitors in the industry, and then you have the threat of new entrants, threat of substitutes for their services or products, the bargaining power of their suppliers, the bargaining power of their buyers. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned before, we've typically been a fragmented industry. We don't have a big Coke or a big Pepsi. We don't have GM or uh, Ford. Uh, so you can imagine how different the dynamics work. Let's just walk through that for rheumatology. The threat of new entrants, um, it's not high because you've got to go to medical school, you've got to do medicine, you've got to do rheumatology, you've got to get board certified. So those are big barriers to entry. The threat of substitutes uh, has not been borne out. And the evidence of that is historical. Back in the early 90s, as I talked about, when there was this shift to managed care, many forecast that we were going to need not only fewer physicians in the U.S., but we were going to need fewer specialists, particularly rheumatologists, because there was going to be this gatekeeper effect where primary care and internal medicine was going to manage most of the chronic disease and not refer, because that's how they would get paid more. Well, that didn't happen. But because that was forecast, some programs closed and some programs reduced the number of seats, and that's part of why we had a little bit of a constraint on training uh, during those years. So 
what they demonstrated to us is, is that the internists and the primary care docs and the orthopedists and the homeopaths can't do what we do. So the threat of substitutes is uh, virtually nil. We can have some bargaining power of our suppliers. We're not like Coke who can get their sugar and whatever they need at greater prices because they're huge and the other industry participants ride off of their strength. But we can group together and group purchasing organizations to buy some of the materials that we use uh, for practice. But over here in the bargaining power of the buyers, that's where we run up against it. As I talked about, most of the lives are captured now by government through Medicare, Medicaid, or through managed care. And they set the prices. So the analyst, our analyst, would recognize that the basic law of supply and demand, you know, the major ruler of the free market, isn't working here because there's distortions. And if you think about uh, supply and demand, if you have a demand curve that's advancing to the right, supply curve, that's us, receding to the left, the intersection starts to rise, and that's the price point. So in this dynamic, we should be at a premium. We should be demanding high incomes and so forth. But because of these distortions, that's not happening. There's two areas of distortions. One we talked about, and one we're going to talk about. The first distortion is the payers, government managed care, like I talked about. And we have this quirky thing in our antitrust laws in the US that allow insurance companies to collude on the prices that they're going to pay rheumatologists, right? But it's illegal, and you can go to jail as a physician if you collude on the prices that you're going to set. You can't talk to your buddies in your community and say, we're not taking any less than this. That's illegal. And as I mentioned uh, in that one diagram, there's always been this cognitive procedural discrepancy where you get paid more to cut and sew and read images than to sit down in front of a patient and work out a treatment plan. The second area of distortions traditionally has been us, rheumatologists, and it's what we call the inconvenient truth. Rheumatologists are not typically entrepreneurial. They're more cerebral. They just want to do their job, see patients, practice good medicine, uh, as opposed to some of the other specialties where people have been highly entrepreneurial and highly advocative. Um, so I think many people in, in this room could tell you conversations they've heard where physicians have been embarrassed to insource some services that they would traditionally outsource, like imaging lab, infusions, and so forth. And the rheumatologists during the early uh, 2000s were notoriously poor about coding at the appropriate level for their services. They tended to undercode so that they would fly under the radar and not be kicked off uh, healthcare plans. So we somewhat did some of this to ourselves. So we're looking at a market failure. A market failure is where there's a great demand for a product or a service, but the, the workings of the market did not satisfy that, and it takes government or altruism to step in uh, to do that. And we tend to think of that as like the arts or education or something, but it's happening to us. And it's not just that constrained pricing relative to supply and demand. We have a constrained labor market. Ordinarily, in such circumstances, immigration would help to fill some of the gap, and that's not working here. There's bottlenecks throughout our educational industry. It's too expensive to go to college. It's too expensive to go to medical school. Uh, if you go to a Caribbean or a Mexican school and get a better price for your education, then you can't find a PGY-1 slot to come back. We don't have enough PGY-1 slots for our domestic graduates at this time. So how are you going to get through medicine and get into rheumatology if you can't get a PGY-1 position? And there's this persistent ambivalence in our society about medical care in general. Is it a right? Is it a privilege? Should it be structured like our infrastructure um, with Medicare for all, um, like our highways, like our power grid, like our public schools? Or is it a privilege of those who have the money who can go into the free market and buy those services? And as I mentioned before, we've now got this third shift where even in managed care, more of the costs are being shifted to out-of-pocket through um, co-pays and deductibles uh, that are really getting large. So a patient now comes in and money is in that discussion because they're paying more. And what a lot of physicians 
tell me is that they're seeing a change from a covenant relationship that they have with their patients to a contractual relationship where, you know, first of all, you're going to do your best to, uh, to get the patient better. And now it's, you know, doctor, I'm paying a lot and I expect results because I'm paying a lot. And if I don't see results, then somehow you're in breach of contract. And that leads to cynicism on the part of both the physician and the patient. And it's part of why we have this huge uh, rise in physician burnout. I think we're at 54% now. So these are the market pressures, and there's opportunities in each one of these areas to change our direction. So uh, I'm going to shift now to just some constructs of working in a, a service business. Um, and people are going to build on this through the day. If you think about your organization, particularly in private practice, you can, it's, it's nice to conceptualize it as being an internal environment and an external environment. The internal environment is what goes on within your walls. Uh, and the external environment regards all of that exchange work outside that it ultimately affects your bottom line. And in addressing the internal environment, a useful uh, paradigm is this age-old services marketing triad where you, the company, are trying to address your customers, your patients, and your staff members, who you should conceptualize as your internal customers. And the model works like this. You set the promise about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. You're going to deliver the best rheumatology care. You're not going to do the rest of their internal medicine or be up all night refilling prescriptions. And you enable the promise by letting your staff members know what it is, your internal marketing. And I can't overemphasize this, because if you don't spend the time to train your staff from your front office to your nurse practitioner, back office, and if you don't pay them well, if you have a revolving door of staff, you're going to struggle to deliver on that promise. So you'll hear more about these relationships today. The, problem, the mistakes that get made are obvious. Don't create expectations that you don't plan to meet or that you can't meet. And you, a failure to build that internal customer, your staff member, is critical uh, to your success. Looking at the external environment, I think most of my colleagues uh, would agree that in rheumatology, this involves four sectors. One is contracts, your evaluation and management payment. And although I've talked about fee schedules, they are somewhat malleable if you can negotiate well. I mean, you can change that dynamic by sometimes up to 20%. Um, next is vertical and in, uh, horizontal integration. That is adding services or working how you get your supplies. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then the functional relationships that you have with your exchange, exchange network, whether it's a hospital, whether it's your referring uh, physician base or your specialist that you refer to, the legal and regulatory entities that you have to uh, interface with, um, that's important to your bottom line. And then what we're doing here today, we co cooperate with our colleagues through our guilds uh, for strength, and that strength is applied to how we get the patients who need care, how we get them that care, and how we survive in doing so. So Vertical and horizontal integration looks like this. Our core competency, of course, is the diagnosis and treatment of rheumatic disease. But we have lots of services that happen in the course of that, from imaging to labs to infusions and so forth. And if you can conceptualize the healthcare dollar, think about the Medicare dollar, about 18 to 20 cents of that is what goes to you for your cognitive effort, right? But your pen drives that other 80 cents. It drives it, and it traditionally would drive it outside your office to other entities who would perform these services, and they would profit from those services. So if we're a dying breed, if we're contracting and we're not meeting the demand, it behooves us to try to drive that cash flow not outside but inside. So vertical integration means trying to insource as many of these operations as you can. Horizontal integration means looking at your suppliers and looking at your buyers and trying to get closer to them. And as I mentioned, we can participate in group purchasing organizations to drive down the price of our supplies. You can become the supplier of your own space by buying or building your own building. Over here, there are some groups that have been more successful than I have been 
at going to large employers and going around managed care and directly contracting for rheumatology services, say with Boeing or Microsoft or Intel. Um, and if you have the opportunity to do that, that can be helpful. There have been other responses in the US to these management issues of rheumatology. And the ones I'm most familiar with, you may have heard of US Rheumatology. It's a group that's capitalized by memberships and is uh, partly capitalized by CuraScripts. They have a management group that takes the fees and for your fees you pay, you get access to management services, whether it's helping you negotiate your contracts, whether it's helping you develop and run your cash flow cycle, um, finding other staff. There's an outfit called American Arthritis and Rheumatology Associates, a, a, an aggressive, a bold group. Uh, they are, have put together a multi-state group under a single federal tax ID. They're developing a common EHR. They do have more or less an external management group called BenCare that gets a percentage of the revenues of everybody and um, it's capitalized by membership. You get ownership shares. Another response is called US Rheumatology Network and I, I think they're still going. It's capitalized by a supply company called McKesson and uh, what they mainly do is network with rheumatologists to, uh, for group contract negotiation uh, to try to get you favorable payment. Uh, they have a palette of management services that you can uh, buy and they will take a portion of the increase in your fees from those management services. Uh, and you can get favorable pricing on your infusibles if you go through McKesson. And then there's other groups like ours and several other larger rheumatology groups in the country that are single groups, they're self-capitalized, they're fully rheumatologist owned, um, and they work, our, our group works with integrated business units. Each of the ancillaries, whether it be imaging, lab, or whatever, has to stand on its own. It's not subsidized by any of the cross businesses. And then the uh, physician business units, we have teams with a rheumatologist and two or three or four advanced practice clinicians working together with an administrative assistant. And uh, although we all kind of look the same, we, we stand on our own. Um, so that's a model that's worked for us in Arizona and um, in private practice um, is, I think, a favorable uh, model. So things are getting better, it looks like. Uh, the interest in rheumatology seems to be going up. The number of program, uh, of fellowship programs has gone up from 2012 to 2016 by 13. Our applicants have gone up uh, quite a bit. The positions of available have ticked back up to where they had been previously. The total positions now, as I understand, are about 454, and we can expect our programs to generate 250, uh, 215 uh, new rheumatologists per year. So this is good, but still represents a bottleneck when you look at those uh, workforce study figures. So in my role, in our group, uh, it's been helpful to me for many years to kind of look out the window and look at the larger world society, domestic society, and see what's going on in other industries and try to understand how other people react to the forces in their environment and what they do and how I can benchmark off of that. And you know the story. Our, the way we travel changes. There's been so much um, aggregation in the airlines. Now we get around with Uber and you know we've got the sharing economy and Airbnb that, uh, where we stay. In education, they're really getting uh, hammered more and more by these uh, massive online open courses. You can get degrees online through Udacity from a major university, a fraction of the cost. In communication, you know, uh, how we talk to each other, how we make payments, how we get our news and entertainment, how we bank, um, a lot of people don't really go to a bank ever. They're doing all their transactions on their smartphone. And you can get your money for investments now from other places other than a bank through financial technology, crowdsourcing, lending trees, so forth. You know, we've had this struggle with our energy generation where we've got wind and power, uh, wind and solar and hydro that just, we wonder if they're just about to tip. And the problem has been how do you get those 
types of energy to the cities where they're needed. Now we're seeing the development of this ultra high voltage DC transmission that looks like it's going to pretty much resolve that issue. So things are changing. In medical technology, we're all aware of the oncology and immunology therapeutics advancement, but we're, we now have to be thinking about other things that are not typically medical technology that are really going to advance the quality of lives of our patients, like these human exoskeletons that can make a worker stronger or make an elderly person mobile. Our elderly may have to give up their driver's license, but they'll have self-driving cars, uh, Uber self-driving cars. Um, and in healthcare, we're having to think differently than how I was trained. You, you know, we think about one-on-one -on -one patient relationships. And I, believe me, our medical legal system enforces that. And now people are talking to me about population management. You know, how to identify your sicker patients and concentrate on them. And I don't know how I'm supposed to take care of everyone else, I guess, with APCs. But it's a dimension that's unfamiliar to me, but I'm going to have to grapple with it. We've got other things. We've got big data implementation. I mean, we used to get our knowledge from um, controlled prospective clinical trials, both in terms of efficacy and, and adverse events. And now we're seeing things like omeprazole may be associated with dementia, with renal failure, with osteoporosis. This all comes from big data. We're never going to get that type of information uh, from clinical trials. And then we have to address how in this dearth of rheumatologists do we meet that demand? And most of it's what's going to be filling the gap is going to be advanced practice clinicians for a while. So each one of you, when you finish your clinical training, you're going to have to learn to be a manager of people. You're going to have to train people to work alongside you. Nurse practitioners, PAs, they've got to learn to think like you, talk like you, deliver information like you, learn your algorithms, and be you. They have to extend you to a larger population. So those are uh, the challenge in that age of accelerations. A guy named Eric Beinhacker wrote a book in 2006 where he talked about this model where we look at our physical technologies versus our social technologies. Physical being stone tools, moving to horse-drawn plows, moving to microchips. And the social technologies are the beginnings of the use of money, uh, the rule of law, regulations to protect society and create a level playing field, and then these big ideas like uh, the UN. And typically, traditionally, these have been enabling each other um, in this way. And business technologies like the firm, capital, uh, and so forth have also sort of leveraged that relationship between physical and social technologies. But now we're in a funny age. If you think about Moore's Law, you guys know that that's the idea that you can fit, you can double the amount of memory you can fit on a microchip. Every two years it seems to double. It was one year for a while and then it got to be every two years and we thought it was going to plateau out. It still hasn't plateaued. In 2007 when the um, iPhone first came out, we saw this hockey stick flexion point in terms of the acceleration of these technologies. And now we're at a point where our progress in our social technologies can't keep up. We've got these uh, EHRs that may help accounting, but they don't help me deliver care. We've got biologics that we think, wow, these are really good drugs from the stuff that we had in my first career. But we've got problems with payment systems, with workforce allocation, with medical legal problems, trying to get those treatments to the patients without a huge hassle. And that's the failing of our social technologies to keep up. Thomas Friedman, in his most recent book, Thank You for Being Late, amplifies that struggle between technology and human adaptability. He talks in two terms, dislocation and disruption. And you can think about um, this technology curve that's taken off and the inability of humans to adapt to that. And the only way we're going to match these uh, up is by all of us, from our front desk people through us, to adopt lifelong learning, keeping up with the technologies. And we need better government, which we sorely lack right now, to help society keep up with technology. 
disruption. Uh, my family and I were in Morocco in November, and we were getting off a train and going to get ground transportation to our hotel. And I'm kind of looking for taxis, and one of my kids pulled out their cell phone and called up a couple of Uber cars, right? Uh, for me, that was the first time. Um, and so we walk out of the station, there's this long row of red taxis and the taxi drivers hailing us and we find our Uber driver. And as we're walking over to the car and starting to put our luggage in the trunk, the uh, driver kind of hustles us into the car because we're being surrounded by this throng of taxi drivers, right? And it gets noisy and loud and for about 20 minutes, they're kind of pushing this driver around and roughing him up and yelling at him. And we're watching this happen. And um, so eventually he pays some money to a couple of cab drivers and they let him get in and we take off. But it, it gave me pause. I'm witnessing disruption where you have a stable industry that gets crowded out by not another car company, but by a technology. The ability to have people who are in the sharing industry where they've got excess capacity in their car and their time, they're going to try to leverage that to some money. So it's crowding out a very stable industry and it gives me pause. Could that happen to my job? I mean, wh what are we looking at? I mean, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and so forth. Long story short, I don't think we're going to be replaced any time in the near future by artificial intelligence. I think the subtleties of my examination, my interaction with patients and convincing them of what they've got and what they need um, is way beyond what we can do. But I think we're eventually going to be enabled by intelligent assistance where when I open my laptop, I'm not just tacking in information. I'm going to be getting pop-ups that have already digested the patient's demographics, their previous meds, you know, their other comorbidities and so forth and give me better ideas more quickly. It may even come as augmented reality. Maybe I'll have glasses on that these ideas will be popping up in my visual field as I'm looking at the patient. What we may get disrupted by is something like CRISPR Cas9 uh, gene splicing, where we actually identify people pre-morbidly and change uh, their disease course. So. Solving our manpower problem, we have to look at other places. And this is what the workforce study uh, tend to agree with, and that it's not just attracting others by reducing, uh, attracting new physicians by reducing their opportunity cost. We need to train, expand our training capacity. It'd be ideal to put new training programs in areas of the country that are underserved. Um, uh, we need to use advanced practice clinicians to mine that gap. So it means that we're going to have to not only recruit new doctors, but probably for the next 20 years, we're going to be recruiting APCs as best we can. Now, it's a double-edged sword. You know that our specialty is very nuanced. We have very few defining tests and images. You have to aggregate a lot of cognitive information to make the right decisions. That's hard to train an APC to do, but they can do it. Uh, working daily, uh, you, you, you build on that knowledge base. And there are APCs in my practice that after two or three years with us, I would match them up against any rheumatologist outside our group. Uh, they become very competent very quickly if you uh, tutor them correctly. We need to lower the load of things like osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, and pain management that others can do, uh, and maybe better than us, uh, we need to get government, if we're going to lobby about anything, we need to think about loan repayments. You have as much money into your education as somebody who's in orthopedics going to make two and a half times you're going to make. Uh, so there's room for us who are, we're almost becoming an orphan situation where at least there can be some loan repayment if we uh, go to areas. We need immigration reform. You've often heard that if... Uh, an international student gets a master's degree or PhD in the STEM areas that they should have a green card stapled to their diploma. I think we should do that in rheumatology. I, I hate to see us continually brain draining other countries, um, but we've got to respond to our own crisis. Academic rheumatology will continue to have that responsibility of mentoring medical students and residents and trying to get them attracted to rheumatology. 
We, as I mentioned, need to nurture the efficiency of our businesses, nurture our own business acumen, and nurture that sense of ownership that makes it, that gives us the drive to work so hard to try to meet the demand in the market and do it with quality. Um, so, to some, Albert Einstein told us in 1946, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We'll have incremental progress while waiting for some great new advance that's unforeseen that's going to change our dynamic. But I think, in the meantime, advance it again, please. So you guys were born into the digital age. You were born into the biologic age. You don't carry a lot of this baggage. Um, but we're here to tell you today to begin to adopt a broader understanding of the dynamics of the healthcare marketplace that you're entering and listen closely for clues on how you're going to address that. It's going to be a good ride. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to be successful. Um, and I think you're a lot better prepared than the speakers today were. So I'm stopping there and I'll take questions now or 